Hey everyone, thanks for joining me. My name is Mark, I'm a couple of Fern chapter, and today we have a very special program with some of my favorite people from Florida Conservation Voters, Jonathan Weber and Carson Mitchell. Uh, we'll go through announcements really quickly. It's a very special month and uh, FCB has put together a special presentation just for this time of the year. So welcome to Couple of Fern. We're a chapter of the Florida Native Plant Society. As you probably know by now, our mission is the conservation, preservation, and restoration of Florida Native plants and native plant communities. Um, in case you don't know, it's October. It's Florida Native Plant Month. So we've been doing this for several years. Um, it is a statewide initiative. Uh, get out there, appreciate the fall in Florida. And yes, we do have one. Um, so here's some pictures just to demonstrate that. Uh, this is our uh, Bach Tower, and this is submitted by Nicole Jones, and this is a scene from Bach Tower going on right now. In the uh, bottom, you will see a uh, mounds of love grass, and they're blooming, and that's why you see a nice pink haze around each mound. So love grass is in bloom at this time of the year. Uh, this is actually from South Florida. This is Palm Beach County. Sabrina Carl has submitted this. And uh, what we see here is joint weed, and it's uh, just bursting in all sorts of hues of white and pink. Um, and interesting fact about this plant is that uh, usually it's very nondescript. You can't really notice that you're looking at joint weed when it's not in bloom. But when it's in bloom, lo and behold, it definitely is a show-stopping plant. So it's very pretty. And this is your fall in Florida. And it's not just local to Florida. This is our neighboring Georgia and Taylor County. And this is a super bloom that is happening right there uh, in a wildlife management area called Sand Hill Wildlife Management Area. And here we have Liatris, which is the uh, purple spike plant, along with goldenrod, which is yellow. So it's all across the Southeast right now in different stages. And October is certainly beautiful. Uh, there is a fall in Florida. So get out there and check it out. In case you're a couple of Fern member, kudos to you all. You have put in well over a thousand hours in reported uh, volunteer time with FNPS. This is valued at over $24,000. And the year isn't up yet, so please continue doing so. Uh, our website is under routine maintenance. They just sent out a email maybe a half an hour ago saying that it's up and running now so once this is all good to go continue to report your volunteer hours literally it'll take you 15 minutes but it'll definitely serve as a tracking uh, metric for state to say look how much work we're putting out and how much work our volunteers are doing out there across the state uh, so come and grow with us on our native plant journey. A couple of firms is very eventful, as you probably are aware. We have events, field trips, workshops. Virtual learning is really the name of the game right now during COVID. Uh, community gardening, internships. We are uh, getting quite a few requests from interns to so come join us. We'd love to start you off whenever you're ready. We do environmental study areas to study how plants change and plant communities change over time um, and plant sales. We do those quite a bit too. We are accepting social media nerds. <laughs> so in case you happen to be one of them, we're looking for junior editor positions in Facebook and Twitter. Um, we've come a long way. We know when to curate posts, who they target, what time to uh, target them, what day of the week. Uh, we can show you the back end of things and analytics and optimization. Uh, and you can learn along the way a lot, uh, a good deal about native plants in our local environment as well as international news. Um, so it could be a college internship in advertising, it could be a job reference, or it could be simply a way of you giving back to your community. And these are all the things that we're doing <laughs> just this month. So we're doing a couple of garden chats. Uh, the directors have really taken off, Jennifer, Gia, and Kaylee. Uh, just an amazing job. Um, you know, I've seen them grow and develop into their positions, and it's been a delight to really see them, uh, you know, where they are right now. So it's been great, and they'll be back. They're doing baby native plants, how to recognize them. Uh, they're doing a fall in love with uh, Florida's fall. Uh, tonight's program, of course. We're doing an online membership drive just in time for October Native Plant Month. So we'll be sitting down with Valerie Anderson on that. And then there's Bat Chat, 
uh, which is a spin-off of Garden Chat. And that will be conveniently on October 31st, Halloween, which is Saturday at 11 a.m. So just go to fnps.org if uh, a couple of furnace for you. Um, fnps.org, click on join, and then in the drop down, you can see Couple of Fern, and it's simple as that. Uh, they have student, individual, household, and business level memberships. So there's something definitely in there for you. And here is the rundown. So October 17th is Florida's Fall in Love with Florida's Fall. So it's at 4 30 and it's free to all, no pre registration required. And it's from 4 30 to 6 p.m. Uh, the next one is on October 24th, and it's Discover Florida Native Plant Society, all the different facets. If you have any burning questions about what FNPS does or if there was something that you uh, heard but didn't know more information about, Valerie Anderson would be more than happy to discuss those uh, tidbits with you. And it's online, no pre-registration again, 3 p.m. to 4.30. October 25th is Baby Native Plants in the Garden. We're focusing on Central Florida plants. And it's online again, no pre-registration, visible to all, 4.30 to 6 p.m. And then October 31st, Halloween, it's Discover Bats in Florida. So in case you are interested to know about all the different Florida bats that we have, I believe we have 23 species altogether. Definitely tune into this. Uh, Fish and Wildlife uh, Commission will be joining us, a couple of biologists from there, as well as Emily Stanford, which is the communicate, who is the communications manager at batbnb.com. So it's from 11 a.m. to 12.30 p.m. And tonight, it is my pleasure to introduce uh, Jonathan Weber, who's the deputy director uh, for Florida Conservation Voters, and Carson Mitchell, which is the communication, who is the communication manager for FCD. And they'll be discussing some uh, Florida conservation success stories with you. Fabulous. Well, thank you so much for having us, Mark. And, you know, I don't know, about, you. I don't know about you, Jonathan, but those look like some great events, the baby native plants, those bats. Um, it's been really awesome to see Couplet Fern really embrace um, these digital events. And it's it's really some great work, Mark. Truly. Yeah, I, I think it's wonderful, especially that bat event. I love bats. And that's just what a, what a cool event, especially on Halloween. Hopefully you can get some kids on to maybe watch, too. There'll be a lot of fun. Yeah. Yes. So I'm going to share my screen. Um, one moment here. So today we want to, oops, excuse me. Uh, we just want to talk about um, some really great things happening in the conservation community in Florida, um, both state, uh, local, and some federal conservation successes. So, um, Jonathan, would you introduce yourself, please? Sure, I'd love to. So my name is Jonathan Weber. I'm the Deputy Director of Florida Conservation Voters. I've been with uh, this organization for over four years now, uh, and I've been in the conservation movement in Florida, I guess you could say really since I uh, graduated grad school, which was in 2009. Um, I got my start working on a local political race up here in Tallahassee, and there was uh, essentially my job was to do a bunch of research on offshore oil drilling in Florida. That was my job. And that kind of led right into uh, my career, uh, which has been in environmental politics and communication for, like I said, about 12, year, 12 years now or so. Um, and I do live up here in Tallahassee with my wife and my son and my dog. And I am from Broward County, uh, Fort Lauderdale area, uh, but I've been all over the state now and I absolutely, you know, just fallen in love uh, with our native uh, plants and our birds and our animals and our just our, our special places that we have. And it's just delightful to be here with you all today because I love the Native Plant Society uh, and I'm just happy to be here. Thank you so much. Awesome. And I'm Carson. I'm the communications manager of Florida Conservation Voters. Um, basically, if you see it, uh, with an FCB logo on it, it's probably me behind the curtain. Um, so I'm really glad to work for uh, Florida Conservation Voters. Like Jonathan said, we have some awesome partners who really make our work easy, um, like Native Plant Society. Um, I grew up in rural North Florida, High Springs. I was actually born in Geneva, Florida, near, um, near your chapter here. Um, but really that love for the outdoors and our springs really has driven me um, into this work. And I'm really excited to share with you all um, the work that we're doing. Mm -hmm. 
So let's kind of uh, go back in time a little to 2014. Um, Jonathan, mm -hmm. FCV came out of the Amendment 1 campaign. Can you kind of give us a premise of that? I'd love to. And um, thank you, Carson. Um, so many of you probably know this, but maybe some of you don't. So uh, just bear with me for a moment. So you may, let's go back in time to about 2010, 2011, uh, after the Grace, just as the, we're coming out of the Great Recession, you may remember that Florida's budget was kind of uh, in a shambles and there were cuts happening all over the place. We, there was a program called Florida Forever, still is. Florida Forever uh, is extremely important. We're going to talk more about that in a little bit. But the Funding for that specific program and essentially all conservation was zeroed out, just totally went to nothing. And that happened for a couple of years in a row with some little dribs and drabs of funding, but nothing to restore it back to the level that it was at prior to the Great Recession, which was about $300 million a year for land acquisition alone, not including Everglades and other things. So uh, a group of conservationists, maybe some of you in this room were part of those discussions, uh, but they got together and they said, hey, it looks like there is a really strong anti-environment streak going on uh, in Tallahassee at that moment. And they said, let's get together, let's work together and get all the heads of the families from around Florida's environmental world uh, to come up with a constitutional amendment campaign to make it so that a specific pot of money was always there for conservation, no matter what happened. It would set it aside specifically just for conservation. Uh, that idea grew into what became the Amendment 1 campaign or the Water and Land Conservation Amendment. Uh, that took a bunch of work to get it onto the ballot. Again, if you are on this call and you helped collect signatures or you told your friends about it, I mean, it was really a you know all hands on deck moment for Florida's conservation community. We were successful, obviously, to get this onto the ballot. Um, and then we fought like heck, you know, to make sure that everyone voted for it. As you can see on this map, we were extremely successful. And we uh, that this, this ballot initiative was approved with just about 75% of the vote. And now it says 75% on there. It was like 74.9. So, so that's what it is. But anyway, so... <laughs> We, um, we, we won that amendment, and which means that the con we changed the Constitution to have a section in there that said that 33% of doc stamps, which are the taxes that are collected when you buy a house, that that money goes into the land acquisition trust fund, and then the legislature can spend money out of the trust fund for a certain set of conservation purposes, like land acquisition, Everglades restoration, springs, land management, all these good things. And now there was a set pot of money that, you know, we thought no one could touch, right? So FCV, we were born out of this campaign. So after 2014, uh, we had a network of volunteers. We had staff. We had things going on. And we said, why would we, why would we leave? Why, why, why would we just close up shop? Why don't we stay and make the most of the uh, work that we have and the network that we've built up to really become a uh, force in the political world in Florida. So we continued on uh, with our two sister organizations, Florida Conservation Voters Education Fund and Florida Conservation Voters. And now we work um, at the nexus of the environment and politics to make sure that we, uh, there are elected officials out there who are standing up for uh, you know, our shared conservation values. Of course, we are a nonpartisan organization. Uh, we believe that the environment is should not be a partisan issue at all. It should not be. And that electing good leaders um, can happen from whatever part of Florida in any district. Doesn't matter if you're red county, blue county, doesn't matter to me. Good conservationists can come from anywhere. And I think it's our job uh, as the larger environmental community to make sure that uh, we are working to, to get those candidates um, to understand their plans and to get, get their information out there about, about, about that. So we grew out of, out of that campaign and we became the organization we are now. And we've grown pretty a, a lot since 2015, really, is when we switched over. So here we are in Tallahassee. We've got seven staff, eight staff. Uh, if you count one other staff person we have in St. Petersburg, you, a person you've all met before, Lindsay Cross. And uh, we're happy to be here today. And you can see this map, which is the result of a lot of all of our good work to make sure that clearly it's understood. It doesn't matter who you are, where you are in Florida. The people of Florida want conservation. They want parks. They want clean water. They want access to recreational opportunities outdoors. They want hunting and fishing and land. They want these things. So it couldn't be more clear. So that's where FCV came from. 
Right. And since then, we've also branched out of just land acquisition and management, but also water quality, uh, climate change action, democracy, um, all with the lens of electing environmental champions. Thanks, Jonathan. So um, as we proceed through this uh, presentation, you'll see a lot of these scanning codes. Um, so I recommend that you follow along with us by um, either downloading an app. Um, I use QR Scanner. Well, um, this just gives you kind of a, a little um, backdoor access to uh, some of the things we're talking about. Um, so for example, this one will lead you to some Central Florida, Florida Forever projects. Uh, so Jonathan, can you share with us um, just what is Florida Forever? Um, yeah, but before we even do that, I just wanna, I don't know if you have an iPhone, if you just open up the camera app, it will now recognize it without having a special app. So mm -hmm. just, just the photo app, the camera app will do it. So just hold it up there and you'll see the little tab come down. Um, when you do that, it'll be, you'll be taken to a PDF uh, that has some sites on it um, from Central Florida that are currently acquired Central Florida, Florida Forever sites. So what is Florida Forever? I bet you've heard that term thrown around a whole bunch. Um, camera. So the Florida Forever actually is, encompasses a suite of programs. Um, there are three main ones, but there's about seven in total, I think, roughly. Mm -hmm. So the first one we'll talk about is, it's actually called Florida Forever. And that is traditional land acquisition as you might think it is that there's a beautiful piece of property for sale next to a spring in some county, pick a county, and the state will then find a way to acquire those acres uh, to complete um, with this, for, for, for a conservation purpose. Um, that's traditional. There's also rural and, and family lands protection program. This is a program that is administered by the Department of Agriculture and Consumer Services. This is a program that helps Florida's ranching and farmers uh, stay on their land. As we all know, especially in Seminole County, there is immense pressure to develop land and to build it out and put in new subdivisions and condos, Walmarts, I mean, you name it. And we want to make sure as well, as, as does many legislators and certainly the ranching community to make sure that some of these legacy uh, ranches and farms go <laughs> to the next subdivision and that they can stay in what is a more passive style of, of land conservation. Um, conservation easements is what they're called. They uh, cannot be built on. They can't be developed with, you know, within certain rules. So it's really a great alternative to what could be essentially the next subdivision, right? So RFL is a, is a big one. And the third one I'll talk about today, even though there's, there's a bunch of smaller programs, the third one is called Florida Communities Trust. It's a wonderful program that you, you know, and actually the parks that are near your house right now, if you've got a small neighborhood little pocket park that maybe has a couple wetlands, a couple acres of wetlands on it, maybe a little boardwalk or something, for all we know, that could have been purchased with Florida Communities Trust money. The great thing about it is that it's a matching program and that the state will put up half the money and the local government put up the other half. And then the local government will then purchase and acquire and manage and take care of these small little pocket parks. I love these parks because, you know, I grew up in an extremely urban area, Broward County, and um, a lot of my friends did as well, of course. And sometimes the only way, the first time a child interacts with nature is at these small pocket parks that are kind of buried in an urban area or in some suburban, you know, like, like Western Broward County is. And, uh, it's just such a vital part of the conservation map, uh, the, the patchwork in Florida. So I love FCT. I think it's a wonderful program and actually sometimes gets overshadowed by the others. And I listen, I like them all. They're all like my children. I think they're all good, but I, I especially like FCT. Um, so anyway, that's kind of the idea is that there's this, a fund that is broken up with the algorithm you can see, or sorry, the formula you can see right in front of you. Uh, so when, the legislature puts money into the Florida Forever Trust Fund and then gets distributed exactly as you see it now. Unfortunately, one little caveat here is that the legislature hasn't appropriated money according to the formula in, I think, over 10 years now. Hmm. What they're doing instead is picking programs that they like for whatever reason, political reasons maybe, and putting money in the programs individually as opposed to using the formula, uh, which is a little, I mean, we, we support the formula. We like all, we, we think the formula works. It's worked. If you want to adjust it, we can always adjust those numbers, but overall the formula is a good thing. Um, so that's one thing we've noticed over the past 10 years or so is that unfortunately 
legislatures are bypassing the law and just doing it piecemeal as they see fit based on the political whims. Yep. Interesting. Was that adequate, Carson? Does that guy explain that well? Oh, yes, very well. Okay. And so give us kind of uh, just a high level rundown of what happened, speaking of the legislature. Yeah. So again, um, we lobby up here in Tallahassee and we spend a remarkable amount of time every single year uh, educating lawmakers about, first of all, what Florida Forever is, why it's so important, and we let them know explicitly the benefits it can bring to their local community or really to the state as a whole, but always to their constituents, right? Uh, so we make sure that they know what good it can do. And then we ask them and we train them as best we can, if they're interested, to become advocates for Florida Forever on the inside while we do the advocacy on the outside. Uh, like many things in Florida politics is that election years oftentimes bring in a, a, a better a better bounty of, of riches spread amongst all the issues in Florida. And in the years, the off years, there's less of that. And that's just, that's just a fact of life is what it is. So if you look at the history of funding for Florida Forever, uh, the suite of programs and the individual programs, over the past 10 years or so, you'll see that it was very low for the first few years after 2010. And then it got dribs and drabs up and down like this until we get to 2020, this year, where uh, the legislature chose to put $100 million into uh, three of the Florida Forever programs, or three and a half of the yeah, three, yeah, Florida Forever programs. We got $100 million this year. Pretty darn good. Nothing to sniff at. We're not going to argue with it. But our goal is to get it back to what it was prior to the Great Recession, which was $300 million a year for the full suite of programs. Um, certainly, we think there's plenty of money to be able to do that, considering we set aside money now from Constitutional Amendment Number 1, 2014. Um, but to start off with, in your local area, just south of you, uh, Senator Linda Stewart did a wonderful job advocating for Florida Forever. She is just one of our greatest champs, and she fought really, really hard to get $100 million into the budget this year. Um, another person we can see on your picture here is Representative Holly Rashine. She was the budget chair in the House for uh, natural resources. She's been term limited, so she's out. She can't, can't run again until, well, not she can't run again this year. But an amazing thing kind of happened. And if you guys are on our email list or you're on other groups' email list, you probably get emails around session time saying, now call in, call your representative and let them know that you support Florida Forever and whatever amount they, they choose. Now, sometimes like we do this all the time. And sometimes you know we try our hardest and we're not sure if we're having an impact at the Capitol. Well, this year we got the greatest sign that we could have got, which is that Holly Rashine, Representative Holly Rashine, said to the crowd at the budget hearing after FCV and I'm sure plenty of other groups sent, it must have been over a thousand emails within, I think it was like 36 hours, right, Carson? Something like that. It was like 36 hours, a thousand people sent emails in. And, and Representative uh, Rashine said, stop the emails, please. You're getting $100 million. It's done. Mm -hmm. Cross it off. So uh, I think that was about all the evidence I needed to know that people like you watching couldn't be more vital to this process and making sure that you are connecting with le your legislators, especially your legislators, your, 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 your locally electeds, letting them know what you care about, telling them that you're going to hold them accountable and you're going to call back after session to make sure that they stood up for the things that you and your family care about. I'm telling you, it works and it worked. We have direct evidence of it. You can watch it on the Florida channel and see her say it. Stop the emails. We're going to fund Florida forever this year. So you're going to get more emails from Carson, likely, uh, in the coming year. Respond to him. Send the email. Go ahead and do it. It only takes a minute, and it definitely has an impact to let your legislators know that you care about a specific issue. So this year, we got $100 million. Next year, like I said, every year we walk into the, we walk into a session looking for $300 um, or higher, whatever we can get, right? Uh, but we were, of course, happy with $100. we are not going to argue with that after the fact. So that's where we are. Awesome. Awesome. Yes. And um, really something that made this year's victories possible was our GEMS report. Um, we were able to pull together just so much of the, the conservation knowledge that um, is shared among our partners, such as uh, Florida Native Plant Society, um, and really create this awesome report. Mark loves it. Um, I know several of you have gotten um, copies, and tonight we will be playing some trivia to uh, do a couple giveaways. Well, yeah, go, go ahead. 
Um, so pretty much uh, we worked with uh, Florida Natural Areas Inventory to put together some maps to really dig in and see um, what conservation successes should we be celebrating, such as Green Swamp here, Adams Ranch Conservation Easement, and looking forward, what remaining conservation lands um, should we be buying? So we detail both of them per region. Um, and uh, I, we did want to share a couple of sites out of this book. Uh, Jonathan, did you have something to add? I want to jump in. So the reason why we decided to spend, which turned out to be a whole bunch of time on producing this report, Carson, I think, did a remarkable job. The whole staff did, but Carson, really, your leadership on this was amazing, so thank you. Uh, the reason we did this is because what we found every single year after, the, after an election, we show up at the Capitol and we have to talk to up to you know, 25, 30 new, maybe more with the Senate and, their, and plus with staff, it could be like 100 new people every single year about, hey, guess what? Florida Forever really matters uh, and you should care. And they have usually no idea what Florida Forever is. Maybe they've heard of it, but clearly a lot of the people we elect have no background in conservation. And that's okay as long as they're willing to learn. We found that the easiest way or one of the better ways to actually explain what the Florida Forever program does, how much good it has accomplished here in Florida, and how much is left to do and why it's so important to keep putting money into Florida Forever was to produce a book like this. It was a wonderful, there it is, a wonderful resource. Um, again, being able to walk into a meeting and do the pitch that I do and then leave behind this gorgeous book makes my job a lot easier because I know for a fact, because I've talked to legislators about it, that they'll throw it in their briefcase, they'll throw, you know, they'll bring it home, they'll look at it, and it's, it's an appealing book, or they'll put it out actually on their coffee table at inside legislators' offices. I've seen that as well, so they just have it laying around the coffee table, and it gets picked up and used, and we can really spread the word and really educate lawmakers on, on how they can act on it and why this is so important to their, to their constituents. It's a, it's a great project. Yeah, and you know, not only do we share just some beautiful photographs from local Florida artists, but we also, you know, took the time to look at every single property and the values there. Um, so you'll see these icons down below. So with uh, Green Swamp, we're saying um, that it's really important for water quality. It's really important um, long term with climate change um, and other values. So, and we also something that I'm proud of, um, and you know, especially hearing it from Mark, is that we took the time to be very specific and very um, precise with the plants that we identified and highlighted here. Um, so it, it's really uh, my greatest pride that that the Native Plant Society. Um, thought highly of this report it just made my heart warm. Agreed, agreed. Yes. So let's just take, uh, take a little look at uh, what we have in here. Um, so like we saw on that last slide, Green Swamp is super important. Uh, it pretty much supplies most of Central Florida's water. Um, so places like these are really important to um, to celebrate the success of conserving because this is everyday um, everyday stuff for, for a lot of Florida. But it's also, these are projects that you continue to invest in, continue um, to expand. Um, so one thing, uh, you know, preparing for this meeting, Mark said, give us niche information. Uh, you know, the native plant folks, they, they know a lot of, of really um, in-depth information about plants. Tell us something we don't know. So. I, I'm trying to step up to the challenge here. So a lot of our lands, including Adams Ranch here, um, help with carbon sequestration. They help mitigate the impacts of climate change. And, and you know, Jonathan, anytime you want to help with this, with this kind yeah. of difficult fact, you just you just pop in. But basically, um, like how trees, um, you know, input carbon dioxide, output oxygen you know, that's, it has an immense value, an immense conservation value, especially in the face of um, carbon induced climate change. Yeah, and clearly climate change is the greatest threat to Florida uh, long term here, even short term, honestly, it's just a remarkable challenge. And overcoming it is going to take uh, really creative thinking from, you know, every discipline that's out there. Uh, of course, Florida being Florida, we have a remarkable amount of natural solutions that we can maximize, or I should say should be maximizing, to make sure that we're doing our part to sequester as much carbon out of the atmosphere uh, as we can. Now, there was a bill, sorry, you just want to say, Carson? 
Oh, so there, there was a bill last year that was sponsored by Senator, or sorry, I had myself, uh, Representative Loran Osley, who is now running to be in Senate. Uh, she sponsored a bill that actually tried to find a way to uh, incentivize carbon sequestration for uh, timber and farmers, um, mm -hmm. silviculture and, and, and agriculture. And I thought it was really an interesting concept and pretty, pretty forward thinking and pretty smart because it again, try to find ways to get our ag community on board with doing best practices to uh, mitigate climate change and do what they can, I think is gonna be vital to the process. As we move off internal, uh, internal combustion engines in our cars, as we move to more things like solar, the ag community and timber community can also be playing a really significant role in making sure that carbon is stored in the ground. Wetlands also provide a remarkable carbon sinks. Uh, so again, making sure that we are restoring and conserving our whatever remaining wetlands we have is key to this process. Another thing that I love about carbon sequestration, I'm sure you all love this, is that mangroves and mangrove forests are actually one of the best uh, carbon sequestration um, like ecosystems on the planet. So Florida, you know, we should be again maximizing our mangrove forests instead of tearing them down so we can have better views of the ocean. Uh, there's a multitude of good things that man mangroves can, can do for us but carbon sequestration shouldn't be discounted and we should be, again, exploiting that, I think, as much as possible because, again, what a, what a value that Florida can provide considering uh, how much of a threat climate change is to us. Yes, and, and this really just like brings home the theme that these lands do work. These are working lands, you know, whether they're filtering our water or capturing our carbon, um, you know, land conservation isn't just about birds and bunnies, which we love, um, but it's really about um, a sustainable world. And it's about, um, you know, having lands that, that can do their natural functions. Um, so you mentioned oceans, Jonathan. Um, another fun fact is just as trees, um, you know, help with uh, climate change, seagrasses also. Mm -hmm. um, so it's, it really highlights the importance of protecting um, our ocean floors and our coastal areas too, um, because they also play a role in that carbon sequestration. Right. And again, seagrass is kind of threatened across the state in a lot mm -hmm. of areas. I mean, if you do any aerial shot of Florida Bay down in the Keys, like get a drone and look down, it looks nothing but scars, like these terrible scars across uh, the seagrass ac across the seafloor. And um, it really, I mean, if you can just Google search those images and it's really puts it in perspective and it's kind of jarring to see that uh, kind of the loss of seagrass in many of these areas. Of course, we know, especially down in Florida Bay and the other estuaries, seagrass is related to land management uh, based on fertilizer runoff and pollution, septic tanks, uh, sewage runoff, sewage spills. So there's all these different things that go into protecting and saving seagrasses, which, as we know, have a lot of benefits. But one one that we're talking about today is, of course, the, the, the carbon sequestration, the blue carbon, as it says down there. So really important. Yes. And I hope it uh, I hope it was niche enough for for my um native plant folks. So uh, let's have some fun. Uh, let's win a GEMS report today. Um, and Mark's gonna put uh, the directions in the comments here. So everyone um, get out your cell phone and go to uh, www.menti.com and uh, put that code in and we're going to play a game. Carson, I think this one brings you to GEMS report. Oh no, go Mencia, sorry, that's the web, that's the. Oh yeah, don't use the, uh, the the code is not for this thing, but yeah, you can also right. prove this a gems report. I didn't read the instructions. <laughs> and I'm gonna share a different screen. One moment, everyone. Okay, so we have a player. Jonathan, are you playing along? Oh, yeah. I'm going in there. Me too, hold on. So menti.com, join a presentation. Awesome, hello friends, welcome to the game. 46473272. And if you hear my cat meowing, it's her dinner time. So sorry, everyone. No trouble. Okay, let's play. So the first question, purple endemic Florida flower relies on prescribed burns and it's found in the green swamp. Did 
everyone put in their answers? Yeah. Okay, so the correct answer was Celestial Lily. Did you get that one right, Jonathan? Do I have to answer? <gasps> Haven't been studying your GEMS report. I have not. All right, let's do another one. Let's do another one. One more. All right, so Homer, you are going to win a GEMS report. We'll get in contact with you, Homer. Thanks so much. <laughs> All right, next question. Question two. Okay, plants endemic to the Lake Wales Ridge. Also from our GEMS report. Oh, this is tricky. Yes, I threw some uh, tricks in there. Garrett Scrub Bulb, Balm. And I had to find the uh, scientific name specifically from Florida Native, uh, from Florida Natural Areas Inventory. Good. Yes, relying on our partners. Okay. So great. So, so what do they win again? They win a gems report. Fantastic. Yeah. So Homer, I will be getting in contact with you. All right, back to our regularly scheduled program, folks. One moment. So the GEMS report, it's really, uh, really helpful for uh, lawmakers and it's fun to look at as well. So, you know, there's state level conservation, of course, which is really important, but there's also local conservation efforts. And um, Florida conservation voters, um, we, endorse candidates, but we also endorse um, ballot amendments and ballot measures. So you can use your handy dandy scanner to read about all six of our uh, endorsed ballot measures. But I really wanted to talk about a local one um, for you all here today. So uh, Volusia Forever is a super um, popular and successful program. Um, basically, it uh, is funded from your property tax values and goes towards um, really awesome purchases and management. Um, some of these places here might be familiar and they were all funded by Volusia Forever. So right now on your ballot, if you're a Volusia County voter, um, you will be able to renew this and um, continue that push for local conservation investments. So this comes back to the idea of the, of the patchwork, right? Of, of conservation. And it's that we really need uh, local government county, state, and federal governments working together to, really, to, to create and, and this, this patchwork that is needed to maintain corridor, wildlife corridors or save really special wetlands or, or places around the state. And, and again, it really requires a kind of an advanced level of understanding of our, of our state, as well as an advanced leadership and commitment level from our elected officials to do, to do these good things. Right. And Jonathan, I will say, too, it also depends on voters getting out and voting for those things and taking the time to research and taking the time to let their friends and family know too. vote yes or vote no on these really important um, conservation measures. So um, even higher than the or so between state and local, the feds are also involved. Can you tell us about like this recent Great American Outdoors Act win? Sure. So. There is a fund uh, constructed in the uh, federal federal government. It's called the Land and Water Conservation Fund. It was established in 1965 to provide funds and matching grants to uh, federal, state, and local governments for the acquisition of land and water easements, uh, really for the benefit of everyone. Um, it's helped create parks and, and protected areas across the country. Many of the ones that you probably know and visit or have been to numerous times part of that property may have been acquired with funds from uh, land and, and water conservation fund. Uh, this fund has been, I would say, underfunded throughout the years and not, it, it's actually, it's, it's been getting less money than in some instances than states give for their own state work. And this, we're talking about the federal government here with a heck of a lot more money than most of the states. So we have been working in coalition with uh, allies across the country 
with our national partner in DC, the League of Conservation Voters, to try to elevate the need for funding the Land and Water Conservation Fund so that the federal government can do their part in this patchwork that I keep talking about. Uh, after years of advocacy, and I've personally been to DC to lobby our congressional uh, delegation here from Florida, I think three times now, specifically just for Land and Water Conservation Fund going back you know, many, many years ago. And after a long time of pushing and pushing and pushing, we finally got a bill that could pass both the House and the Senate. Uh, it was called the Great American Outdoors Act. And this, what this does is it permanently authorizes and funds uh, the Land and Water Conservation Fund um, permanently, which is an amazing thing. And it's really an amazing victory. Now, again, when I said this took years and years, it took years and years. And the key part of it is that it wasn't just, you know, uh, the, the, the paid staff members going to, tell, going, to tell, going to D.C. to talk about this. It was people just like you from local communities across the country speaking up, letting their congressperson know, letting the leadership in the Senate and the House know over many you know years now. Okay, I'm talking about going back when it doesn't matter who's in charge, right? Democrats, Republicans, we've been talking about this for years and really know that this is a priority. So again, thank you to everyone. If you took an action on this, if you called your congressperson and let them know, uh, this is how conservation works in the country, is that it relies on the advocacy of people like you and me and organizations to really help push and educate lawmakers, uh, what is in a very difficult process. So again, our organization, I'm sure there are plenty others in the state of Florida pushing, our people sent over a thousand emails to our US delegation alone. I'm sure there were thousands from every state and here we are, and the president signed this into law earlier, uh, last last month in September, he signed it into law. So good on him for signing that. Uh, I'll say that. And Great. then we'll move on. Yeah. Awesome. Um, so Jonathan, we want to yeah. share kind of a, a little inner workings that we've been working on and debut this new federal campaign, 30 by 30. Well, you say federal, but it's global is what it is, really, right? This is a global campaign. And so across the country, across the world, there are scientists and biologists and ecologists and, you know, whoever, they're looking at the globe and they're looking at population trends and they're looking at development trends and clearly watching our world rapidly get torn down and developed is a frightening kind of thing to consider. And the theory behind 30 by 30 is that if we really want to survive here into the next century, we're going to have to do a really hard commitment on hard, true conservation across the globe. So this is the first step, 30 by 30, really, in, in what is a much larger multi-decade campaign. And 30 by 30, the goal here is to conserve 30% of our land and 30% of our oceans by 2030. Now, the key part of this is that not all conservation lands are the same and that some conservation lands have really high conservation standards. Like for example, our national parks, our state parks, these are really wonderful places. They're gems, they're protected. You know, there's no, really no threat of very often of uh, things happening in the parks. I should, I, uh, but there are other places around the country uh, that are conservation lands, meaning that you can't go ahead and build there, but they allow other things like, for example, oil and gas drilling or uranium mining or whatever it might be, or some other kind of practice that most people wouldn't consider conservation purposes. Mm -hmm. 30 by 30 wants to achieve uh, the highest level of conservation in this 30% of the world. Um, I think that there is a lot of momentum, um, certainly from Florida, considering Overall, we've done a good job protecting a lot of our important lands over the past 50 years or so. Uh, clearly, we can do more and we need to do more, but that is kind of the gist of it. And again, it's going to take you, me, our counterparts in other countries, and really it's going to have to be a people's movement across the globe to really put pressure on the leaders in every single country to make sure that every country is doing their part to protect our land and water. Um, personally, I don't think there's a way, uh, there isn't a sustainable path forward without doing something like this. So it's going to be an all hand, another all hands on deck moment as we really try to save the planet uh, to make it for our sustainable for our kids and their kids. Yes. And like when I say that this is debuted, like we haven't even told our members about this yet. So mm -hmm. native plants, you guys should feel honored 
and I hope you do. Um, so we've been talking a lot about conservation successes and, um, you know, those that are worth celebrating, but we can't do that without also talking about the threats. Um, so like we talked about earlier, um, climate change is the biggest challenge facing Florida, uh, whether you're inland or coastal, um, there is, this is a rapidly growing problem. And as we spoke about earlier, our wetlands can help solve these issues just by being allowed to function naturally um, as carbon sinks um, and to store carbon. Um, so I really recommend uh, digging into this matter um, because as you know, as, as folks that love native plants, you know that the soil and um, the water available and all of that um, really makes an impact. And I'll just jump in. I mean, the people of Central Florida, especially Seminole County, uh, I mean, it's just, you all are sitting on a gem. I don't need to tell you that. I mean, you guys are really uh, in one of the most impressive places in the state of Florida. Uh, and a lot of ways when I, you know, when, when I think about, you know, Central Florida, I mean, it's Seminole County is what I'm thinking about, right? Uh, and the character of your county is just uh, so important, not only for quality of life reasons, but for our ecology and our economy. Uh, and making sure that we protect places like, like Seminole County is just, I think, it couldn't be more important, I don't think. Yeah. Yes, and um, a little west of you all, uh, we're dealing with um, threats of the MCORS toll roads, as well as the sprawl and overdevelopment that you all are uh, facing every day. Mm -hmm. um, so let's let's kind of talk about that, Jonathan. Sure. Um, I believe that Lindsay Cross, our coworker, came and spoke about MCORS earlier this year. Um, but basically, um, the legislature is trying to build three roads in Florida, three toll roads that will impact our water, wildlife, public health, rural communities, you name it. Uh, these roads will touch it. At extreme expense. Yeah, so I'll keep going. So MCORS really is one of the greatest threats to natural Florida that we've seen in, in, our, in, our, in our lifetimes, really. So uh, what the process was is that they passed the bill, I think it was 2019 when the bill passed. By the way, it only got one hearing in the House. Most, uh, most bills, I would say, get about three hearings, some of them four, occasionally two, but the average is three. They still got one, and it was rushed through the process because they knew that there would be uh, you know, a backlog of people trying to testify to say this is a terrible idea and a waste of money. So they pushed it through the legislature. Uh, a lot of press came out about how this was benefiting certain donors and things like that. It was really kind of an ugly situation. It moved forward and the plan was they're gonna have task force meetings, three different task force with meetings uh, around the state in the areas for about, what was it, a year or so of, of meetings, maybe a little mm -hmm. bit more. Uh, FCV, and we are part of the No Roads to Ruin Coalition, which a lot of groups are in. And we were, with our allies, we were at all of these task force meetings providing comment and also encouraging members to speak up and send in their own comments about why they thought this process was uh, flawed, faulty, or just not needed at all. Um, Carson, can you tell us what is the exact timeline now on the draft report that got released? Yes. So the draft report uh, was released on September 29th, um, and they gave us a measly 15 days to gather public comment and to give comments on these um, largely non-conclusive reports. Um, and so the deadline for comment is Wednesday. So with your trusty scanner, you can take action right now uh, just with one click. So as we've talked about um, you know, I, I think kind of a theme of tonight's talk has been that our conservation successes are largely on the backs of normal people like me and you. They're on voters. They're on people who, you know, send petitions and, and call their legislators um, and the work is never done. Um, so, I mean, in this sense, we've really just rallied all all the uh, pro environment uh, forces to speak against this. And I will say Native Plant Society put together some wonderful maps talking about prescribed burns and, and all of the really important ecological and scientific facts that organizations like ours rely on. Totally. And, and, and again, this is a threat to our, our, our water, our wildlife, our, our natural plants. Uh, it's just shockingly uh, bad. And certainly right now, knowing that next year there is going to be severe budget cuts, it doesn't seem like a right time to be spending, you know, billions of dollars on these roads that no one seems to really want. So, Right. And really the last chance to say so is now. 
um, because the uh, final reports will be delivered with their recommendations to the governor and the legislature uh, November 15th. Yeah. So we, uh, we will be waiting to see the result and continue to fight. So um, one last reference to our GEMS report. Um, like I said, we talk about remaining lands. Um, and one of those remaining lands we talked about in our quiz, which was Lake Wales Ridge. Um, as you all know, um, it's home to just an amazing amount of biodiversity, unrivaled un, um, in the world. Um, so these kinds of places are, are worth saving and they require the work um, of native plant society, of volunteers, of um, you know, folks even just tuning into um, this talk or, or the bat talk um, to really um, speak up and and remind legislators that these things matter and they're important. Yeah, and I'll just add, you know, again, a lot of these legislators, if they're from South Florida or Jacksonville or Pensacola, they might not even have an idea where the Lake Wales Ridge is, okay? There's a good chance they've never been there, right? And again, I would wish we could get legislators to go to every single, you know, uh, cool place in the whole state. I'll tell you, I spent the night one time at Archibald Biological Station, which is located in Lake Wales Ridge. Awesome. You got to sleep there in one of their cool little cabins with just the screen up, you know, and you got to listen to the, the everything. It was just a magical night. And... Mm -hmm. I already wanted to protect it before then, but spending that night there and waking up to scrub jays out the window was kind of a life-changing experience for me. And I'll tell you, the Lake Wales Ridge is remarkable. I wish every legislator could have that experience. I can watch them while they sleep, while they enjoy it. But you were right. <laughs> That's awesome. Um, so let's, uh, we wanna close tonight with just reminding you uh, the impact of your vote. Um, so FCV, we work to elect lawmakers who will protect our environment and healthy communities for everyone. And that really starts with you at the ballot box. Um, and this year, you know, we know that um, things have changed, but um, luckily we're able to vote from home, vote from the safety and comfort of our couches and, and uh, living room tables. And uh, one of my favorite things about uh, VBM, Jonathan, is that you get your ballot in the mail and you can you can go line by line, ballot measure by measure, and just do your research, and um, look it up. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, exactly. I think uh, voting by home, voting by mail is one of my favorite things that uh, I've done. This is my first year doing it for the primary and for this, and I'm never going back. I don't think it was great. I got to sit down with my wife. We sat down. I got my son involved. We got to look things up. I really I thought it was fantastic. And uh, again, you have until October 24th to request your mail-in ballot. It's right there. Uh, I think it's easy and fun. Mm -hmm. Certainly there's no shortage of important races up this year. We don't have to get into them. I'm happy to answer questions on it, but there's a lot of important things. It's always an important year to get involved and to make sure that your voice is heard. Definitely be talking to your friends, your neighbors, whoever you, to, the person at Publix, right? Anybody you can to make sure that they've uh, submitted their ballot and that they're getting ready to vote because um, it's just so important. Yes, yes. And um, you can always visit fcv.vote to um, use our uh, really easy to use portal to connect to your uh, supervisors of elections. Agreed. And uh, that's, that's really all I have. Jonathan? No, I, Carson, you did a wonderful job. And again, Mark, thank you so much for having us. The Native Plant Society, I mean, you guys are leaders in the community. Like we know that, the Native Plant Society. So, you know, use your leadership and, and get people involved with your organization. Definitely get people, you know, out into the into the wilderness. Get those kids looking at bats. What an amazing service you all provide. And, and thank you for your leadership. Thank you. Thank you, Jonathan and Carson. Um, we have some uh, questions coming in. I'm going to give a few more Maybe a handful of seconds for people to comment away. I just wanted to surf over to your website mm -hmm. just to show people the 30 by 30 publication that you just unveiled at this presentation is available at fcvoters.org under the publications tab. Mm -hmm. As you can see, it is 30 by 30 in English as well as in Spanish. So we are a Spanish, uh, you know, dominated state here. A lot of Spanish speakers, mm -hmm. a very useful resource, especially for our uh, second language English uh, speakers. Um, but there's so, so much more. There's sea level rise documents. There's uh, you know, uh, regional specific documents here for the greater Tampa Bay, South Florida, Northeast, Northwest, Central Florida, which I believe you covered during this presentation as well. And that's all under the FCV voters, um, I believe it is right under, 
publications right under the news tab, the third button down. Mm -hmm. Additionally, they do have this vote tab, uh, which Carson and Jonathan just closed out their presentation on. And it's right here. And if you uh, use the drop down box, which you'll be prompted to, and just, uh, you know, we happen to be in Seminole, but here are all the locations that are conveniently populated for you. Um, so no matter where you stand, it's just important to exercise your right to vote. And that's what we are trying to impart to all our viewers. I want to thank uh, Jonathan and Carson so much for their time. I mean, this was just a fabulous presentation for a very special month for Florida Native Pine Society. October is, has always been and always will be a very special month for us. Um, we have a commenter. His name is Kevin Sonder. He happens to be a member. Uh, and he writes, if wetlands are such a good uh, carbon sink, why does the state, counties, and cities spray herbicide on cattails so often? Why not cut the cattails and make compost instead of herbiciding the cattails and letting the dead plants fall back into the water as in a live cattail sequestering more carbon than a dead one? Um, do you guys have any uh, anything to respond as far as pesticide? Or <laughs> if you heard this comment before, on people saying, why use pesticide to kill a plant when a live plant is doing a good job at carbon sequestering? Yeah, well, I think that you have to look and see, well, is the plant native or not? And is it is it where it should be in, in providing the service that it should be it should be preserve, pr pr producing? Now, if it's if it's a non-native plant, I mean, clearly, I think we got to find a way to eradicate it for the most part, right? I think that's usually the, the common theme there. Uh, and then going forward with wetlands, I mean, we're still losing wetlands here in Florida. Like that's a problem. We have a no net loss of wetlands rule, but clearly we are still losing wetlands. So I think before we do anything, we just need to stop destroying wetlands and protect what we have left and make sure that what we have is functioning properly and that we're doing proper land manage management on it so that it can actually provide the service that it should be preserved, that it should be doing like aquifer recharge or carbon sinks or wildlife, anything. So that's kind of where I would start and we can deal with the herbicides and everything after that, uh, which clearly I would rather not see herbicides if we don't need them, right? Yeah. 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 Herbicide, mm -hmm. go ahead. Yeah. And, um, you know, conservation funding funds management too and management innovation. So there's there's always ways to best manage our, our lands and it starts with funding them. Good question. Yeah. Well, folks, if there's any other comments, we are going to close out the uh, program for tonight. I want to thank you both again so much for your time. This was just amazing. I learned a lot. And uh, in case you guys are just tuning in, this video will be available in our library 24 hours from now. So you can certainly uh, go back and watch it again. So thank you so much both. And uh, yeah, happy October Native Plant Month. Thank you, Mark. Thank you. All right. Bye, guys. Bye.